Uh, my name is Rob Robinson, and uh, I'm with Channel D, and we make a product that's useful for high-resolution transfers of, of vinyl to high-resolution digital formats. Um, and normally, uh, in the past years when I've given this seminar, I would start out with the computer completely disconnected and just to prove how easy it is to hook everything up. But uh, I, I think everybody knows that it's pretty easy to hook up a computer by now, so we'll skip that step. <clears throat> and so what I'm going to do, since obviously it says I don't have a wireless mouse uh, provided, I'm going to uh, remote control it with screen sharing from this laptop. And that's, that's, a, that's a feature that's built into the Mac OS operating system, and it's really easy to use. So just uh, bear with me just for a second while I turn that on. Okay, so basically I've, I've got a, a mirror of that screen on my laptop. So, of course, I could use a mouse and keyboard to do this. Oh, the reason, the question is why not just use a laptop? I could do that. Uh, I've got pretty much the presentation on this old laptop. And I want to show, I want to demonstrate something with, uh, with the Spectrum Analyzer, which runs on this OS version. And so I, I, it's, it's a little difficult to demonstrate on a newer version, but it's certainly a viable way to go. So what I'm going to do in this presentation, I'm going to cover the basics, uh, what you need to know, what you need to have in order to do high resolution transfers of vinyl to digital formats. Uh, I'll demonstrate the use of the equipment by hooking it up as I go along and just explain uh, the purpose of each component. And, um, and so we'll go from there. Uh, three things you need to do the vinyl transfer. Of course, computer, and you need analog to digital converter, and you need a, a way to store the information. Uh, and we'll cover all those things. And of course, a record player, yeah. Um, the goal that I'm going to be aiming at here is not just simply getting vinyl into a digital format for a purpose of convenience. We want to treat this as a high fidelity reproduction medium. So we're going to use high resolution digital to do the transfer. Uh, and the goal here is to, as faithfully as possible, transfer the information from the grooves of the record into a digital file and capture everything that we need to capture. Um, I'm going to talk about sample rates. I'm going to talk about file formats and, and et cetera, those sort of things. So uh, let me just first start by hooking things up, and I'll explain as I go along. And then we'll start to um, record some vinyl, and then I'll answer some questions while we're waiting for that to, to proceed. And then uh, once that's finished, I'll show you a few other things. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? No, all right. Okay, we have the computer. We need another piece. Um, and a question that I get very often is how do you connect the turntable to the computer so that you get the analog information into the computer. And you need something that's, that is generally referred to as an audio interface because you're interfacing analog audio to the computer. And in a box like this, you have an analog to digital converter and also typically a digital to analog converter so that you can monitor what you're recording in real time not unlike a three-head cassette deck or a multi-head reel-to-reel recorder. Uh, of course, everybody that is in this room, I think, has probably used those devices, too, if you're interested in vinyl. Is Oh, no, this is not. OK, is an example of an audio interface. This is made by a German company called RME. And there are dozens and dozens of these types of devices available at different price points. This is about $1,200. Uh, you can do very decently, starting at about $400 for an audio interface that does 192 kilohertz, 24 bits. Uh, and there are examples of these products on our website. Uh, if you go to our web page, it's at the domain called gettingstartedwithcomputeraudio.com. 
and it gives examples of these types of interfaces. The $400 one is made by TC Electronic. It's called the Impact Twin, and it's very popular with our users. And again, all this information is on our website. So um, this is a tool that's used in the pro audio world and also for home recording. Um, and these are extensively used in that, in that marketplace. Um, but they also lend themselves very well to transferring vinyl to digital. The only problem, one of the problems is how do you connect a turntable to something like this? Okay, well, the traditional way if you have a tape deck is you connect a turntable through a phono stage and that amplifies the signal to the level where the, phone, where the uh, tape deck can accept the signal. Um, you can also use a phono stage in between the turntable and this type of device, but we will uh, be using a slightly different technique where we replace some of the analog electronics in the phono stage with software that does the RIAA compensation curve. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. So typically you would have connections from the turntable with uh, RCA type connections. Um, you can use a simple adapter such as this, which is a RCA to XLR connector if you have a moving coil cartridge. And this type of device also has microphone preamplifiers inside that supply enough gain to boost the analog level of the turntable signal so that you can get it into the digital domain. If you have a moving magnet cartridge, a high output moving magnet, then you would use a different type of adapter. Um, these things are called combo connectors, and if you've never seen one before, there's actually an XLR three pin connector and a quarter inch phone plug combined into the same connector. And that's, that's a question that comes up a lot. So the, the two, circuits are wired independently so that you can use one for moving magnet, one for moving coil. On this turntable, I've actually installed XLR connectors on there and replaced the coaxial analog cable with a shielded twisted pair, balanced, okay? Why balanced? <clears throat> well, microphone preamplifier, microphone is a coil in a magnetic field. Um, there are two connections, positive and negative. Same thing with a, with a phono cartridge. Uh, there is a coil in a magnetic field, so you would use <clears throat> a similar type of ampli amp amplification device. All right. Yes, that would, that would connect directly to this device, as I'm about to do. Okay, there's, a, there's gain in here up to about 60 decibels. It's adjustable. And that's typical of these type of devices which are intended for home recording because people connect microphones and musical instruments to these devices need to amplify the signal in the, dig, in the analog domain. Okay, this is a, a FireWire interface <coughs> and it uses a FireWire connection. Okay, this is an example of a firewire cable. It supplies power and it also serves as a conduit for data. So it's a bi-directional conduit. Uh, data flows from the device to the computer and also from the computer back to the, to the device where we will use it for analog output. So I'll hook that up right now. Okay, the, the FireWire provides power as well, so you don't need to attach a wall ward to this. Um, on the Windows platform, sometimes FireWire ports will not supply enough power. That's a six pin port. Of course, a four pin port does not supply power at all. Uh, but on the Mac platform, even on a laptop, you can connect one of these devices directly with a FireWire cable and it supplies power as well as a conduit for data. Now we connect the turntable. Okay, 
Uh, probably some of you are thinking, well, doesn't a cartridge on a turntable require a certain type of loading of capacitance or resistance? Um, that is something that you do definitely have to address. And in this case, I've incorporated 100 ohm resistors into the, R, into the XLR connector. Um, my company also sells inexpensive adapters. If you want to do this, uh, we have adapters like this, which will incorporate your, specif your specified resistance into the connector. And so you just connect this between the turntable and the audio interface. Whether it's, re whether it's moving coil or moving magnet, uh, we have adapters available. OK. <clears throat> now, getting back to the idea of the goal of making a high-resolution digital transfer of the audio from the LP. Uh, you're probably aware of USB, these USB turntables. Um, this is not the type of hardware that we would be using in this situation because the USB turntables will have a, a phono stage built in, also an analog to digital converter, but limited to very low resolutions, typically CD quality or less, 44.1 kilohertz, 16-bit. That's not enough for vinyl. Um, you know that 16-bit audio has a dynamic range of about 96 decibels, OK? But there's another factor that's important here, and that's the resolution. 16-bit versus 24-bit. If you think of the digital um, conversion representing an analog waveform as a kind of staircase, a 24-bit re representation of that waveform has a lot more steps in the staircase. And in fact, it's kind of like, it's analogous exactly to if you go to a restaurant and there's a, a stair and then there's a, a ramp for handicap, you're basically improving this, the, the precision and, and resolution of that representation of the waveform and the ramp is, is really about 1 256 as rough as those steps. So you're, you're getting a much smoother representation of the analog waveform. Uh, so we want to use 24 bits. And that also has an advantage because it gives us some extra headroom when we're capturing the signal. We don't have to get the signal level right up to digital zero full scale. OK, so that's resolution. And then there's another aspect to resolution, which is sample rate. Um, if you go on the internet forums, you'll find that people will say, why would you want to use a high sample rate with analog audio, with, with uh, audio from a turntable? Because there's nothing really above 20 kilohertz anyways. And it's a poor fidelity quality signal. Well, I'm about to prove to you that there is actually stuff higher in, in frequency and that we do want to, to try and capture everything that's on the recording. Okay, so um, let's see. I'm going to somewhere around here. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch a spectrum analyzer software application. And we're going to take a look at the frequency content of the information that's on the vinyl recording. OK, um, I'm going to change the display so that instead of showing two dimensions, which is amplitude versus frequency, we're going to see three dimensions, which is amplitude, frequency, and time. OK. And I'm going to launch another application so that we can actually hear what we're seeing. OK.
Okay, the display is showing frequency along the horizontal axis, and the maximum is 96 kilohertz, and amplitude is denoted by color, so a brighter color is more amplitude at that frequency. And then, of course, time, because we're watching a waterfall plot scroll by. And as you can see, there's significant information here out to the limit of our capture, which is determined by the sample rate. We're using 192 kilohertz, and that means that the highest frequency we can capture is half of that, which is 96 kilohertz. So the finger snaps have, have information going out to the limit of our capture. And I think this is a good illustration of the reason to use high sample rates for capturing vinyl. Um, perhaps maybe five, six years ago, um, disk storage was expensive, and there might be a rational reason for using a lower sample rate to save on disk storage. But right now, um, disk is so, is so cheap that we can um, use the highest sample rate available for the capture. Okay. Um, and this is the, the reissue of this recording. And it's kind of interesting because um, digital audio has finally caught up with analog from 60 years ago. OK, now we're going to uh, do a transfer. And then as soon as I start the recording going and demonstrate how that goes, I'll open up the floor to questions. We can do that in progress while that happens. and then. Um, We'll continue after we're finished with recording a few songs. Okay, we'll be using the software that's made by my company. It's called Pure Vinyl. Um, you don't have to use Pure Vinyl to transfer vinyl to digital. There are other alternative applications available, even free, uh, something called Audacity, which is an open source type of software. Um, but we've really engineered Pure Vinyl for this specific task to do this transfer um, easily and quickly. That's correct. OK, so to record vinyl, you just click the spindle and then enter in the information uh, of the recording. Uh, it, it's limited in this case to um, the label manufacturing information, but you can add metadata later on. Okay, one of the features in Pure Vinyl is uh, an automatic triggering feature. And so what we do is we set a trigger level, which is just above the background noise level with the stylus lifted. Uh, and this is one thing that I mean about having features that facilitate this final transfer process. Uh, something like Audacity kind of takes you back, in a way, to the old cassette recorder days where you have to have one finger on the stylus lift and one finger on the record button. Otherwise, you'll capture some extraneous information you know, by the time it takes you to hit the uh, record button. Um, while this screen is up, I'll explain a few things that are present here. File format. Okay, so. We're going to create a native sample rate audio file at 192 kilohertz. We're going to use an AIFF format. There are some other options available. Uh, there's an Apple lossless format, which I usually prefer nowadays because it does save disk space. It'll save 30 to 50% depending upon the program content. And 
you can capture the recording with a vinyl correction curve, the RAA correction curve applied, but you put yourself at a disadvantage because you, you, you basically cut, eliminate some of the options you have later on, such as for pop and click removal, and also for normalization, because the vinyl correction curve itself does, um, when it's done in the digital domain, actually improve the resolution, and I'll show you that uh, in, a, in a few seconds. Okay, so we hit record, and it's waiting for the audio trigger. It's waiting for me to drop the stylus. Sorry? Yeah, just a second. Okay, um, let me just say a few more things. Signal levels. Okay, uh, obviously we, we have the signal level is a little lower than optimum. Um, normally what you would do is you would adjust the gain on the input stage, and I'll do that. I'll show you how to do that. For instance, on this RME Fireface, they give you a little control panel, and all you need to do is just change the input gain like this, and you'll see that'll bring the, the signal level up. Now, because we're using 24-bit resolution here, you don't have to be obsessive about getting the signal level up to digital zero. You have some extra headroom here because you're working with 24 bits. So I usually shoot for around minus 10 or a little bit higher. You can adjust the overall gain of the system with a typical type of recording that you would be, rec you know, would be using. And then forget it after that. And just watch uh, for peaks that, that hit zero. And there's a peak level indicator on the screen here which shows you if you've gone over digital zero, where you hit digital zero, and also um, the overall peak level. So we're right in the sweet spot here. That's correct. So you have to, and also typically, you would take a look at this overs indicator, and if it is a tick or pop, it'll be a very brief over. So you might have two or three overs here, and you can usually deduce from that that it was a tick or pop. <clears throat> okay, now one other thing I wanted to, to just mention is that instead of using a traditional phono stage, we're doing the RIAA compensation curve in the digital domain. Uh, as you probably already know, when, a, when an LP recording is made, you don't just take the master tape and cut it directly to the vinyl lacquer. You pass it through an RIAA emphasis circuit, and what that does <coughs> is it improves the efficiency of storage of information on the LP record. The high frequencies are boosted, and the low frequencies are cut. Cutting the low frequencies enables you to squeeze more grooves per, per disc, in, you know, along the entire radius of the disc, and not throw the stylus out, right. And the, boosting the high frequencies emphasizes the treble so that when you actually play this recording back, you use an inverse of that curve. Yes, and de-emphasizes the treble. And boosts the bass. Okay. Yes. So if you have less than 18 minutes, would you worry about the increasingly group size and minimizing the bass Yeah, the question was, um, it seems like 18 minutes is about optimum for the length of an LP in terms of keeping the base um, information intact and not cutting it when the LP is, is being pressed. Is that correct? Yeah. 
Well, you know, as consumers, we don't really have control over that, so we have to use the recordings that are given to us. And, you know, I've seen some LPs that have 34 minutes of information on a side, and, you know, they push 70 minutes, which is, which is quite long. Um, it's a shame because it, it does compromise the quality of the recording, but, um, you know, the, in, in terms of recording, it doesn't really matter because we just wait a little bit longer, and all that information is going to be saved to the hard drive anyways. Okay, now, one thing that this does in the digital domain, which is really, really, really great, is that, think of as Super Audio CD. You start out with digital information that's one bit, and then you low-pass filter it, and you get PCM back that's 24 bits. Where does that information come from? Where does that 24 bits of resolution come from? That comes from the low-pass filtering. You can't just take the 2.8 megahertz DSD signal and get 24 bits from that at the same sample rate. There's, there's a trade-off here, and by reducing the sample rate, decimating, we gain resolution. Same thing with the RAA filter. This is a low-pass filter. We're cutting the treble and we're boosting the bass. And so after the digital transfer, we actually pick up two bits, one to two bits of resolution just from this filtering. So now our headroom is increased from 24 bits to 26 bits. So this is one reason not to be concerned about the recording level because we can make it up later provided that it's not more than about 12 dB or two bits. And we don't lose anything. We don't add any distortion or anything. Okay, I'll take some questions now. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, you'll see. It's very easy. Yes. Yes. That's right. Well, no, no. Actually, we we want to not use a phono pre because we want to avoid the use of the RIAA compensation in the analog domain. No, I understand that, but yeah. I mean, you know, at least in the old days, what you might say or last year, was there was, you know, there were certain sort of options for that, including yeah. the of some of the other options. So, uh, but and, and that's not the way, in terms of loading and optimizing the cartridge performance, yeah. it feels like it's going to load this sort of tactic with the two, not three problems we found on the next year at cartridge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Unless I misunderstand your question, that's exactly what a conventional phono stage does. You know, if you open it up, there's a load resistor in there that you select. And a capacitor, yeah, yeah. Especially for a moving magnet cartridge. It's fine. Um, the lowest moving coil cartridge is available. 0.2 millivolts is no problem. Yeah. Yes? Two questions. Yeah, I'm sorry, it does. Yes. Yes, that's right. It's, it's right now. Um, you know, I haven't really. It, I'm sorry, I, yeah. My second question is Are you now recording the whole side of that album as one file? Correct. But if you wanted to, you could stop at the end of the song and create Yes, yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's right, especially with the latest version, which is going to be released before the end of the month. Uh, it makes it easier to do that. Um, we do capture the entire LP into one file, the LP being a single LP up to you know, 99 sides. So I don't think there's any 50-sided LPs, but um, you can go in and break it out. that's correct. Yeah, and I'll show you how, how easy it is to do that. Yeah, Audacity, I believe, does have a reverse RIAA curve. Uh, I don't quite know how accurate it is, because that's one of the things that we're really concerned about, is the accuracy of the RIAA curve, and one of the reasons for doing it in the digital domain, because you know we can match the, the standard curve very closely. Um, the other thing is that we've designed the RIAA filter to emulate the analog counterpart. We use continuous time in 
infinite impulse response type filters, which are analogous, analogous to analog. Yeah. Um, the other thing is you, you have some other options here, which you don't have to choose at the time of the recording. Um, for instance, there's a subsonic filter. Since we're in the digital domain, we can do DSP operations very easily. So you have an adjustable subsonic filter, adjustable in frequency, adjustable in slope, things like that. Pop and click removal. I'm of the opinion that um, if, you, if you use a blanket type of pop and click noise reduction scheme, you're also going to be removing some musical information from the recording. Pure Vinyl has a surgical pop and click removal uh, tool that lets you pick out individual major pops and clicks. If it's a current recording, then you're better off trying to find one on the internet, a, a pristine copy, um, which can be done pretty easily. The only time you really need, in my opinion, to use the blanket pop and click noise reduction would be for an irreplaceable recording. And in fact, uh, a feature that's going to be coming very soon in Pure Vinyl will enable you, let's say that you, you have two copies of a recording and they're both slightly messed up, you'll be able to, to patch in pieces from each one to create a pristine copy if you really want to do that, if you don't feel like moving, removing the pops and clicks. Yes? It's going to be 3.1 and that's coming out on October 23rd. will be at www.channel-d.com. And we also have the domain uh, getting started with computeraudio.com, which might be a little bit easier to remember and has information about this hardware that you, that you need. Now, I'm showing you, I, I'm trying to resist like overselling the stuff that my company does, but if you want to see a higher end way to do this, uh, come up to our exhibit room which is 482. I'm using an all-in-one audio interface here which has microphone inputs. I'm using the microphone inputs for gain. Uh, my company also makes some phono stages which do not have the RAA correction circuit in and they're optimized for this type of application. They're low noise, ultra wide bandwidth. You can also get uh, one of our phono stages with an analog RAA circuit installed in it if you want to stick to an all analog signal path. But I have to say that um, only a small percentage of our customers uh, actually get that option. But it does sound very, very good. Uh, in fact, um, uh, I just do audition the difference between the digital and the analog RIAA. And it's amazing, really, to me, that how, how close, it's funny to say this, how close the analog comes to the digital RIAA. But it's very close, and, but the digital is slightly better. Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, flip this record over now. Uh, lift the stylus, and you see it, it. Oh, I increased the gain, so it's going to. Let me let me just turn down the. I, I increased the gain, so basically the the trigger uh, point has moved as well. So let me just bump that back down to where it was. Normally you wouldn't do this. I'm just doing it for the demo. So. Okay, yeah, we were, we were at about 50. Uh, this, this, um, this is a control panel that comes with the audio interface. Okay, typically you'll find something like this. RME is really good because they have really good link between software and the hardware and enable you to do things using these sliders on the screen instead of turning knobs on the uh, actual audio interface. Okay. So you see now stylus list lift detected, and we're ready to record side two. So I'll just flip the record over. Okay, now you can do things like clean the stylus, uh, go get a cup of coffee or whatever. It will wait until you're ready to begin recording again. So one of the features is, is it automatically mutes the audio. So I can clean the stylus now without creating transient noise in the loudspeaker. So when I'm ready to record again, I just hit click when ready to continue recording.
Okay, so now we're recording again. And I can change the analog volume, output volume here without affecting the recording level. That's only for monitoring. A question that we get frequently, and it's really, it makes me uncomfortable to have to answer this question because the answer is not what the person asking the question wants to hear. I have a DAC, I have a DAC, and I want to start recording vinyl. So what do I need? I need an analog to digital converter, correct? And yes, that's correct. But what they're asking is, can I also buy an analog to digital converter and use my existing DAC? And usually the answer is no. And the reason is because to do live monitoring like what we're doing right now, the sample clock of the analog to digital converter and the digital to analog converter have to be locked together. And the only way that's typically done is to have them in the same box like this. A pro professional quality interface sometimes will have a clock, a clock connection where you can synchronize analog to digital, digital to analog converters. But that's not typically found. You don't typically find standalone analog to digital converters because you know you need to hear what you're recording so it's kind of like having a tape recorder without a way to listen to what you're recording so okay uh, it's happening in the same box so we got in the army yeah that's got a DAC as well is an analog to digital converter built in and that's typical of these audio interfaces made for home recording You'll, you'll find DAC and ADC. So even if, let's say you don't have a DAC, you can use this in a digital audio playback system as well. Um, now, we get this question enough that, you know, again, it makes me uncomfortable answering it because people don't like the answer, but we're trying to figure out a way that you can actually synchronize them in software for monitoring so that you can actually use independent devices, but that's, we're not quite there yet. But bear in mind that even if you do have that type of setup, any recording that you make will be, perfectly, will be perfectly executed. You'll be able to play it back without any problem. It's just the monitoring where this becomes an issue. Yeah, okay, the question is, uh, we're seeing the digital input signal levels here, of course, after the analog to digital conversion. Um, is there a risk of saturating or clipping the signal in the analog front end where we're, do we're applying the gain? Yes, absolutely there is. So there are tools, for instance, on most audio interfaces that will show you if they're clipping. But typically, the they're, they're um, engineered so that when you get analog clipping, you're getting digital clipping at the same time. So the gain will, will match. And if you, if you see clipping here, you're probably getting analog clipping as well. So that, that's not really a big deal. Yes? Uh, basically, those types of interfaces are what you get when you get a USB turntable. Okay, they typically, you know, I, sometimes I wonder why they even bother because they're tr they're treating the vinyl as something a low resolution format. Um, again, we're after high resolution here. Those are going to be 44.1 kilohertz, 16 bit typically. Okay. NAD, uh, there are a couple of other ones on the market that, that make that type of thing. Um, you can also get audio interfaces that work at line level, and then you have an outboard microphone preamplifier that you would connect to that. Okay, but, but then it gets more expensive as well. Yes? Can you recommend uh, some names of analog, digital, digital analog converters? Yeah, sure. Uh, again, these are on our website at gettingstartedwithcomputeraudio.com. But, uh, for instance, uh, TC Electronic, uh, the model is called an Impact Twin. It's about 400 bucks. You can get them from Amazon. They're very popular among our users. You'll be astonished, astonished at the sound quality. 
even some of our users with high-end phono stages will get an impact win, and they'll, they'll, they'll just be amazed at, at how good this sounds. The economy of scale in the pro audio marketplace is such that their R&D budgets enable them to put this really high-quality uh, audio uh, into, these, into these inexpensive boxes. It's a FireWire interface. Um, okay, uh, I should probably bring something up there. Uh, you probably know or have heard rumors that FireWire is going away on Apple computers in the future. Um, well, Apple has solved that problem by providing a $30 Thunderbolt to FireWire, connect, FireWire adapter. It works perfectly. Any of these legacy FireWire interfaces will work fine. <clears throat> yes? Apogee Duet 2 is another good one, yeah. Yes, it does, for either moving magnet or moving coil cartridges. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's about 600 bucks. Apogee Duet 2, that's USB. The original Duet is no good. The, the analog front end of it is, is terrible, so you don't want to use that for this purpose. Duet 2 is, is excellent, yeah. Um, something like this Army Fireface is about $1,200. What you get when you buy a more expensive interface is you get lower distortion, lower noise in the converters. Um, and there is a difference. Um, but what I'd suggest is if you're curious about this, get an inexpensive one. Once you see, see how good it, it, it can do, you'll really whet your appetite for something better. And, and then you know, it's, it's really a lot of fun. Ah, excellent question, excellent question. Okay, um, another question I get frequently. I've got one of these Korg uh, MR1 DSD recorders, and I want to use that to record my vinyl because it's 2.8 megahertz, and it's a perfect copy, and so forth. The difference with that is that, number one, you won't be able to apply the RAA curve in the digital domain on the DSD data without converting it to PCM. So if the goal is to capture it as DSD, then any putative advantage to capturing as DSD is white dot during the, the PCM conversion process. So you might as well convert to PCM in the first place. Okay. The other thing is that those type of recorders don't have a way to use a lot of these convenience features like the trigger level because the computer doesn't have a data interface to those converters at real, real time when you're recording it. So you don't know the level on the computer. You can't do this triggering. And then you have the pain of transferring the files from that recorder into the computer at a later step. So when you do this, you really want to minimize the number of steps you have to go through because you want this to be fun and not have to be a whole slew of things that you have to remember every time you do this. What it should be is that you don't alter your LP listening routines at all except for just starting out the computer and pressing record, and that's it. Uh, and again, I would suggest if you're interested in this sort of thing, don't try to go into this thinking, I'm going to convert all of my records and make a, a job out of it. Um, just play your records like before, uh, only press the record button on the computer, and then the next time you want to pull that record off the shelf, play the digital copy. It'll be identical, really, in this case. You'll save wear and tear on your stylus, and you'll avoid, you know, dropping the record or you know, keep it on the shelf. A question back there first, uh, behind you, and then you, yeah. Wow, well, I to go back to the Yeah. In your experience over the past few years, dealing with this, and the search engine was pretty What kind of impact uh, when you really hear the same as the converted to either 96 or 192 are you hearing the same signature of cartridges uh, that you might listen to an analog rig? In other words, you know, my tendency would be to do a DL-103 or 103R because it's, it's great for transcription work. And, you know, it's not the world's best cartridge by any means, but certainly works well in this, this environment. So what are your thoughts on that in terms of cartridge, the type of cartridge? Absolutely. You know, you can hear the difference between the recordings and the gear that you're using. And that's another reason not to want to... Uh, get into this as as a as a career, because after you after you've done maybe a couple of dozen LPs, maybe you're going to want to upgrade some of your your hardware, and um, if those are favorite recordings, you might want to uh, 
uh, re-transfer those. And now, this is great, because now you'll be able to AB your old gear with your new gear without having to go through the trouble of realigning cartridges and that sort of thing. You can compare tone arms and things, you know. I mean, a dealer could, could make some recordings of high quality LPs with different types of gear and someone that wants to addition these things, they don't really have to have them into their home, at least on the first iteration. The dealer could give them snippets of these recordings and say that's what this cartridge sounds like, that's what this tone arm sounds like, and then if they narrow down to a short list, then maybe they could do the in-home audition there and save a lot of time. Does the RV only work with that one? No, it's, it's all platforms. Do they have a for the Yes, they do, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Windows, Linux, yeah, it's a very flexible uh, uh, machine. It's about uh, two to three gigabytes. For, for a two-sided album, if we're recording a compressed, lossy, lossless compressed as we are here, 192 kilohertz. You had a question? Um, <laughs> there's two questions there. You're kind of begging the question that there are USB 3 audio interfaces, and there aren't. And there are unlikely to be in the near future because FireWire and USB work just fine. You don't need any more bandwidth than USB 2 provides, even for multi-channel recording, you know, 16 in and 16 out at the highest sample rate. USB 2 is ample for that. So I, don't, I wouldn't wait for USB 3. Um, use the audio interface standard that you prefer, be it USB or FireWire. Uh, but typically what you want to do is you want to use for instance, if you have a hard drive that's a FireWire hard drive, then it's better to probably use a USB audio interface and vice versa. Or use like a network attached storage, which would attach via Ethernet. Yes? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an old question, really. It's, it's the same, you know, yeah, tone arm, cartridge, turntable, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, I, I guess if, if you want my own opinion, I, I would probably lean towards cartridge, you know, because that's really where, where the, that's, that's where the rubber hits the road, you know. That's where you're really extracting the information from the record. And, okay, so you have a maybe less capable tone arm, um, and it might not enable you to deliver, the cartridge to deliver all it can, but at least, you know, you'll be, that's probably a good place to start. Yeah. A couple of quick comments on that. I've heard a fair amount of vinyl to hear that. And for years, early on, I was using transcription tables where we, you know, back to you. That, that's the reason for a deal on the Is that they have a tool like this, right? This makes it a lot easier. And trying to grip a vinyl album with a, a GMW R, for example, or some kind of pivot, is a nightmare if you're trying to get it right where you want it and go from track to track and that type of thing. But with this software, you really can use just about anything because it, it automates a big part of that process and it makes it a lot easier. And so I would agree, I would think cartridge and <coughs> electronics and signal path are probably the most critical. Why is the Pardon? Why is the Just just because of, of positioning and, and flexibility. I think a gamble mount arm is better for, for viewing and back view. Here you're not doing that. So in other words, if you're trying to get right at the beginning of the song, uh, you know, most transcription work, I yeah. would not have done a direct drive. And, and you'll see how the queuing bit is, is really facilitated by this. Okay, so I'm going to lift the stylus now, and, and uh, we'll get to the next step. But you had a question? You alluded to the work on the Uh, okay, yeah, this, this presupposes that you're going to jump in completely and use something like this, which is the RIAA correction in the digital domain, because I think once you hear it, you're going you're gonna to really be interested in doing it that way. Use, use, the, use the digital input system. Yeah, you would, that's right, that's right. You would use it for real-time playback. Absolutely, you don't have to record. Um, you could just use it for real-time playback. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> okay, so uh, now what I'm going to do is click stop recording, 
and open and pure vinyl. And this will finalize the recording. And what we're going to do here is we're going to create a cue guide image from the audio that's in the recording. And so basically, we're, you know, we're going we're to cue this like it were a regular analog turntable. And you'll see how this helps when we actually split the recording into individual tracks. And obviously, I didn't record the entire uh, album, only a few tracks on each side, just to save time. And for uh, those of you that are users of Pure Vinyl, uh, you'll see some of the new features here that are coming in version 3.1. Okay. So now what we do is um, we're, we're going to define the tracks. So what I do is select new track, and then we drag the stylus. And we do these in reverse order, and I'll explain why in a moment. But don't worry, because they'll be placed in album order, not in reverse order. So we'll drop that there and click uh, Add Track. Let's see, I might as well name them, because then I'll show you the next step where we actually play these back in iTunes. <clears throat> it helps to have the album jacket handy. Okay, then I'll add another track. You just drag the um, virtual cartridge to the intergroove space. Hmm. Try typing with the microphone in one hand. Okay, so, um, and then finally, the first track. Okay, and then now we do side two. And you see it's relatively fast process. Okay, so we've identified the tracks, and now uh, in answer to a question from the audience about the normalization, uh, there's an automatic um, feature that enables you to do that. So in the editor menu, you select render tracks, and there's only one situation where you need to worry about normalizing the signal levels, and that's if you render split out the individual tracks to physically separate recordings. Okay, so now, let's say that you've done that for all the tracks on the recording. You end up with a file. Basically, you're storing, storing about twice as much data. The only time you would want to do that is if you want to have these tracks be portable that you can play on other devices without having to use the RAA compensation in pure music, uh, pure vinyl. Okay, so we can add that and render phys separate, physically separate tracks. Correct, yeah. So um, we would render as track files and then click preview output levels. And the preview actually 
uh, if you have a, a computer with uh, four processing cores, it'll allocate a core for each track to very quickly determine the signal levels in the recording and then automatically set the normalization level. And you'll see this, pro the amount of gain that we're going to be adding is probably going to be a little bit higher than usual because I had set the recording level lower than I, I would normally have wanted to do. Quick question on the cores, Rob. This may not apply yet to the Apples, but is, is, is it threads or cores? In other words, you take advantage of assuming that Apple adopts the newer i7, for example. Yeah. Or will you take advantage of the eight threads? That's right, yeah. So it takes advantage of multi-threading. Th multi so each one of those processor cores acts as two virtual cores, and it really does work twice as fast. Okay, so. Oh, actually, uh, the, the normalization gain wasn't that much, okay, because I probably because I turned up the gain at that one place in the recording and we were getting peaks, peaks near zero. Um, there's also gain applied by the RIAA curve, and that's arbitrary. We can adjust that, and we can adjust the amount of gain in the recording. Um, the amount of gain required by the RIAA curve depends upon the program content. So if you have something with a lot more bass in it, then the amount of normalization gain is going to be less. But that's all taken care of automatically. And again, you don't have to worry about changing the gain after the analog to digital conversion because we've got these two extra bits of headroom that come from the RIAA compensation curve. So we're not adding any distortion. We're not boosting levels artificially just, just to get the levels up as you would in a, a normal flat analog recording. Okay, so I'm going to use the alternative here, which is to render as iTunes bookmarks. And what this does is it creates tracks that appear in iTunes that point to the original recording. So I can play these tracks just by having them in the regular iTunes playlist. So you can, you can create playlists, you know, random play. These, these are just like regular tracks that you would rip from CDs, only they point to your high resolution vinyl recording. And the RAA curve is automatically applied when you play these tracks because Pure Vinyl knows that these are one of these virtual tracks. So I'll go to date added here. And so these will, okay. So, um, and I can just select this and, and play one of these if we have the volume up high enough. Let's see. No, it's not. Okay, you notice that the Q position was pretty close, and I didn't fiddle around with that at all. That's because we use a combination of computer smarts and human smarts to determine the, the track position. The human smarts come from you. You move the stylus. You put it in between the tracks. You tell the computer where the track split is approximately, and then the computer takes over from there and calculates where the beginning of the track is. So 90% of the time, you don't have to make any alterations to your track positions. So, you know, this removes a lot of the pain of manually splitting the tracks because it automatically does find the track locations pretty well. So, are we going to go back to the uh, rendering screen before you move on? Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm curious about what was at the, at the bottom of that screen and rendering for a lower resolution file. That's right. Um, I kind of glossed over some of the features in the rendering here. When I, oh wait, oh I didn't save the, the tracks. Um, fatal mistake in a computer, not saving something. Okay, so, <laughs> so uh, I'm just gonna, what I'll do is I'll just create one big track. And actually, um, there's, there's a user out in California and and uh, um, we, we have free remote support, okay? Basically, we log onto your computer, and if you have a problem, it's usually me. I can show you, you know, what to do right on your computer. And uh, he's already done, uh, I don't know, 500, 600 albums in like two months, you know? So uh, I said, boy, you've been busy. And, 
And, and yeah, he does. <laughs> he does. And he calls during work hours. <laughs> okay, that's enough. That's all I'm going to say. But, um, uh, but to be fair, uh, he didn't actually split out the tracks in the first iteration. He just um, made each side a big track so that when he played these in iTunes, it would just play through that whole side, you know. Okay, so now that we got a track, we can this menu won't be grayed out, so. Um. So it's like making a list? Yes, that's right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's right, you could do that too. Um, okay, I, I showed you before it renders track files, um, you can do all the tracks or select a track. And the default settings render the track at the native resolution that you recorded them, in this case, 192 kilohertz. There's another option down here where you can use the built-in high-quality sample rate converter. So if you want to make CD rips to play in the car or something like that, it will automatically use the normalization factor and sample rate convert to 44.1 kilohertz for a CD, 16-bit. Okay, and then you can just use iTunes to burn those to a CD. Yes. Yes, absolutely. That's right, which is the best time because the RIAA curve is calculated with 64 bits of precision. That's the same time we do the normalization. They're all tied together at the same time. So the last step is actually reducing the word size to 16 bits for CD. I want to be clear, though, that's a simultaneous writing of a different resolution file. Uh, no, it's not. You have to do it in a separate step. But it's, it's very fast. So if you have the track saved, you just come back and do it on the Exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, actually, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. The question was, does the decimation, is that like averaging a number of samples together to get one sample at a lower sample rate? It's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, it actually uses a digitally synthesized low-pass filter that removes all the high frequencies. So basically, it takes the 192 kilohertz data and removes everything below the Nyquist above the Nyquist frequency for 44.1. So it removes everything above 22.05 kilohertz. Okay. If you were to actually do what you suggested, which is kind of what, you know, what a DSP designer would call a naive way to do decimation, it would add a tremendous amount of distortion. And if you go on our website, we actually have um, um, analysis of different sample rate converters in different software packages, and you'll see the, the distortion they add is just, it's, it's egregious um, because they use, they use a simple uh, sample rate conversion scheme. Yeah, there is actually. Um, on the product page for Pure Vinyl, there is one snippet which is actually from that Elvis recording, the, a little bit of the fever. So there, there's an acoustic bass in there, and of course there's high frequencies, so you can listen to that. I think it's like 30 seconds long. There's a 192 kilohertz version with the RAA applied afterwards, of course, and a 44.1 kilohertz version. Uh, pure vinyl is $279. A question? Yes, you can. Yeah. Um, if the reason for recording at 176.4 is to do rips at a more efficient, uh, to, to, to do CD quality rips, um, I wouldn't bother because if you, if you get into the math of the sample rate conversion, you're, you're not really just doing integer. You can do integer decimation to 44.1. It simplifies the math. It makes it faster. But there's still a lot of calculations on the data that really don't resemble something that um, is intuitive until you really get into the filtering. So the sound quality difference between a simple integer downsampling of 176.4 versus 192, there's no difference at all. So there's no quality loss at all. So you're better off going at 192. Yeah, that's right, that's right, exactly. And in fact, uh, in our product, Pure Music, and actually in Pure Vinyl as well, there's a way that you can play DSD files, which are 2.8 megahertz, with any DAC, even the built-in audio on the computer, and we do this downsampling and decimation in real time, and it actually uses the same, exact same type of filters that are in pure vinyl for doing this, 
And basically, you have to roll off those high frequencies. And again, this decimation improves the resolution so that you start out with one bit and you end up with 24 bit. Yeah. You had a question, I think? Oh, I see. OK. Um, there, there actually is an optimum sample rate converter de design. And basically, the goal is to remove everything above Nyquist. We actually use a softer knee so that you don't get so much ringing at high frequencies. Um, so we kind of, w there's, there's parameters that you can tweak, but we don't really provide those, OK? Um, and of course, you don't really have to do sample rate conversion unless you want to get the s lower sample rate for CD or something like that. If you're not worried about transferring this to CD, you know, and the only reason you want to do that for, for convenience, portability, play in your car, uh, then no, you would always play it back at the native sample rate. Okay, I think that about takes care of the questions, and um, I'd really like to express my appreciation for how attentive everybody has been and for the really excellent questions, and uh, I hope I've really piqued your interest in doing this type of stuff, so thank you.